These statements are fascinating because they capture Lynch looking back at a time when industries and lifestyles that precipitate ecological devastation and are deeply linked with the Anthropocene were being established or accelerated. What's more, all this unfolded without widespread knowledge or even foresight of the planetary impacts that petroculture, massive energy infrastructures, hyperconsumption, and nuclear weapons development and testing would unleash. In that pivotal post-war decade, it seemed as if an opportunity space existed for carefree design and creation under the sign of optimism and exuberance. And yet Lynch, in his unique fashion, swerves wide of pure nostalgia here, like the insect war raging just beneath the surface of the idyllic lawn in Blue Velvet. This vision of the 1950s acknowledges, and more significantly it embraces, the rot and ooze and pollution that accompanied the rise of American industrialization what environmental and other historians call the Great Acceleration. By exploring these dark and deadly elements of the 50s as inherent to the decade's bright optimism, Lynch inhabits a really nuanced version of ecological awareness and aesthetics. He often creates weird juxtapositions of thens and nows in a way that seems particularly attuned to the Anthropocene present, in which we are deeply haunted by the future of climate change and mass extinction that we've conjured has only begun to manifest and materialize. Twin Peaks, and in particular what it's become through the addition of the third season, 25 years after the original seasons, offers a forceful model of eco-cinema in the age of the Anthropocene. The series explores radical complexities and divergent scales of time and space without resolving its mysteries in simple or even stable explanations. While this resistance to narrative conventions and plotline closures has been criticized by some as a mark of weakness, I'd argue this is at the core of Twin Peaks' strength, albeit not maybe for all audiences. I do think there's a need for diverse eco-cinema aesthetics, including the surreal, just as eco-literature has a need for works by people like China Mieville and Annette Okorafor. What's more, within the open-ended surreal word world of the series, Twin Peaks features a broad cast of characters who work relentlessly for love and for the common good, even though their actions will always be flawed, the results imperfect. Many of these characters embody Derrida's idea of infinite responsibility, the idea that even as our actions are always flawed and partly effective at best, we're required, even more by that fact, to be relentless and rigorous um, in our ethical engagement. It's an approach to ethics I find especially useful for confronting ecological futures. I'm framing my claims for Twin Peaks to emphasize how they fit existing conversations about Anthropocene fiction and aesthetics. To triangulate with some key works, let's start with Adam Trexler's 2015 book, Anthropocene Fictions. Early in the book, Trexler writes, quote, as a discipline, literary studies has long experience with just these sorts of problems. Cultural texts like novels, poems, and plays show complex networks of ideas, history, scientific ideas, political discourse, cultural rituals, imaginative leaps, and the matter of everyday life. Interpreting such texts can be understood as a way of describing the patterning of enormous cultural transformations, such as the Anthropocene. Just as important, literary studies can describe these patterns without reducing their complexity to a monovocal account, a set of bare interests, an immovable orthodoxy, or a predetermined certainty." End quote. Clearly, Twin Peaks would confound such attempts at singular interpretations through its open-endedness and complex times and spaces. What's more, Trexler argues that genres, genres of literature and in this case television, come with resources for thinking through complex issues. Twin Peaks is in fact a generic hybrid and one that defies classification rather than existing as mere pastiche. As such, I would argue the series assembles a whole bunch of different resources for thinking through something as complex as the Anthropocene. 
Another source, Tobias Manley and Jesse Oak Taylor's co-edited volume, Anthropocene Reading. In their introduction, they underscore the debate over where the golden spike is located in defining the Anthropocene. They claim that each potential event that could be the spike would determine a unique narrative or set of narratives that follow. The usual suspects for where the spike would be located are nuclear weapons and energy, industrialization and the energy production and in infrastructure that comes with it, and what Tim Morton calls agrologistics. All three of these feature in Twin Peaks' third season as crucial parts of the different timelines and dimensions at work in the series. So while Twin Peaks is not explicit about ecology, it can be actually structured by thinking through core spikes of the Anthropocene. And finally, Anne Kaplan's book, Climate Trauma, focuses on eco-cinema and pre-traumatic stress syndrome, the aesthetics of trauma yet to come. Twin Peaks is driven by complex traumas that confuse futures and pasts, and a scale from the nuclear family to the nuclear trinity test in New Mexico. Now, Twin Peaks is not an easy aesthetic text, but all the existing scholarly conversations seem to indicate Anthropocene narratives and arts are not going to be easy either. Although Twin Peaks itself may serve sort of a niche role in eco-cinema, I would argue that due to its widespread influence um, on more mainstream series, which is well documented through things like Lost, The Leftovers, and True Detective, it's especially worth investigating. Now to get at how season three has dilated and reframed all of Twin Peaks, let's return briefly to the original two seasons. Twin Peaks has always engaged the ecological. In the original two seasons, the series tangled explicitly and implicitly with environmental issues. There was a timely emphasis on discrete and localized challenges. The longtime logging industry in the Pacific Northwest was changing in the early 1990s in response to biodiversity catastrophes connected to deforestation with one of the most memorable and poignant to Twin Peaks examples being the endangerment of the northern spotted owl. The series reflected that context when the local land mogul Ben Horn abruptly turned from pitching to protesting the Ghostwood Development Project, leveraging the endangered pine weasel as a conventionally cute icon for the local environment as a whole. What is the greatest gift that one human being can give to another. The future. I give you a little pine whistle found only in our tri-county area. It is nearly extinct. They're incredible roasted. <clears throat> We observed a sudden and, to my mind, hopeful spread of environmental consideration by the range of town folk participating in the contest. The fact that people from across the socioeconomic continuum of the town of Twin Peaks, from Shelley Johnson to Annie Blackburn to Lucy Moran to Audrey Horn, turned their energies to learning about environmental problems and then to writing rhetorically persuasive speeches to motivate others to care and change was a suggestive, if deeply flawed, instance of eco-cultural growth. Still, the majority of these speeches cleaved close to home, focusing on the forest and fauna of the nearby mountains and valleys. One of the only larger scale ecological insights came from Deputy Andy when he was helping Lucy work on her speech. He says, quote, styrofoam never dies for as long as you live, end quote. In a moment, a gesture, sort of equal parts Sancho Panza and the dude when he's assessing Jackie Treehorn, in a malapropism, Andy put his finger on a big ecological point. Of course the lifespan of styrofoam far outlasts that of a human being, but bump that you out to the collective plural, and suddenly the image of a discarded coffee cup swirling interminably in the Pacific trash vortex becomes an eerie and ominous icon of the human species, having dug its own grave, one venti cupful at a time. The original seasons also activated what I'd call the geological imaginary, in the process making Twin Peaks seem ready-made and ripe for Anthropocene reading. 
A key example comes in season two when it turns out that a crucial time-space map to the interdimensional portal to the Black Lodge is inscribed on the walls of Owl Cave. The portal is connected to the strange forest in the woods of this area that's been known to human beings since the earliest indigenous inhabitants. This ancient aesthetic representation of worlds in flux exists as marks deposited into raw surfaces of the geological record. Rocks to be read, a new twist on the famous Twin Peaks phrase or line, let's rock. Also of note is the fact that the map room only opens after Wyndham Earl rotates a round stone with an owl symbol carved into it inverting the artistic symbol for the living symbol of environmental endangerment in the 90s. The picture of nature is turned upside down in order to expose the bigger picture that aligns more fully with the idea of the Anthropocene. This geological imaginary move to connect powerful rock images with insights into inheritances, past and future, connects the recent third season with the original two. There's a particular scene in part four of the new season that can appear tangential and quirky at first glance, but there's an odd intensity to it that invites sustained consideration. Plus, Twin Peaks has always provoked the audience to pay close attention to the apparently adjacent, as these moments should be seen as helpful rather than harmful to constructing narrative cohesion in a weird and open-ended world. In this scene, an FBI team is traveling inside South Dakota by car. Looking out the window, Deputy Director Gordon Cole, played by David Lynch himself, quips that they're nowhere near Mount Rushmore. Agent Rosenfield, having anticipated this, has brought along a photo of that mountain monument and shares it with Cole. The latter takes a look and in a voice both deadpan and suggestive remarks, faces of stone. Several beats later, the main dialogue and storyline pick up, but that odd exchange and pause linger and echo. For me, the scene recalls part of Tim Morton's book, Humankind, where he says, what is a face but a map of all that's happened to the face? Applied to Mount Rushmore, Morton's idea highlights the way this national monument is a complex map of what has happened to the stone in the form of a human face or faces. And this intentional legacy marked on stone points to an Anthropocene recognition that the unintentional human legacy is inscribed into the planetary geological record and will be available for reading into the long future ahead. As a footnote to this human stone convergence, the writers of a 1990 article in People magazine claimed that, Sher that the sheriff's name, Harry S. Truman, was an homage not just to the past president, but also to a man who became a celebrity of folksy stubbornness by refusing to evacuate his home and resort on Spirit Lake in Mount St. Helens, Washington, and ended up joining the geological record when he was caught by a lava flow that left rocky slag over 100 feet deep atop his abode reinforcing the idea that Twin Peaks has always been linked to the geological imaginary. In addition to the geological imaginary link, oil, or what can be more broadly called petroculture, escalates dramatically in the new season. From the groundwork laid in the original two seasons of the smell of burnt or scorched Indian oil and the small pool of that oil inside the tree circle of Glastonbury Grove, Twin Peaks The Return spills its sticky black carbon much more lavishly. Originally, oil marked the gateway or portal, and that's an excellent and excellently uncanny way to represent the idea that the Anthropocene is a geological epic that emerged through a petrol portal. But now, beyond the oily threshold, we see people smeared in carbon emerging onto Earth to dispense murder and horror as minions of those above them in the Black Lodge hierarchy. There's a really complex coding to these so-called woodsmen that can be read as an indication of ideologies that enable us to continue our eco ecology devastating lifestyles and industries, not only intact, but intensifying. First, the carbon smeared faces generate a toggle between the petroleum that's integral to their being and the despicable performance tradition of blackface. It's next to impossible not to see in the woodsman's faces echoes of the faux African-American villains in D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. This double coding implies a connection between anxieties about human futures in the fossil fueled Anthropocene and those about others who've been cast as evil in order to obfuscate structures of exploitation and oppression that translate into more common experience across socioeconomic rather than racial lines. To reinforce this interpretation, consider how the physical appearances of those performing the woodsmen, as well as their clothing, tap into stereotypical images of blue collar laborers in America and even more specifically, into a sort of combination of loggers and coal miners. These are the people who figuratively and literally prop up the likes of Mr. C in the series. 
The woodsman willingly, at least so it appears, advance the agenda of Judy in a way that invokes analogous questions about how and why people outside the world of fiction continue to support powerful figures who pursue aims that go against the interests of working class folks and the very world we inhabit. Furthermore, to claim that Lynch would infuse these petrol people with complex codes aligns with the ambivalent sentiments he consistently expresses about the rise and eventual disappearance of industrial objects and people. Take, for example, the passage in his conversation with Petra Gilloy Hertz that's printed in the book uh, David Lynch, The Factory Photographs. Lynch says, so these factories are disappearing before our eyes. It's terrible. I mean, it's good in some ways, I guess. They were great polluters, really good polluters. But the fire and smoke and the sounds and the life has a feeling that I personally love. And it's a sadness to see it go. Just like in London, there used to be a fog, you know, the London fog, and it was from burning peat or whatever, and it was very hard on people, but it had a mood, and a dreamy kind of mood. The way Lynch powerfully captures this seeming paradox of terrible and good bound up together makes Twin Peaks a significant Anthropocene fiction. If becoming ecologically aware and active was simply a matter of encountering more facts and data, or about a cute non-human animal compelling people to care, it seems like we'd already see some wholesale change. With Lynch, instead of listicles of 10 easy things you can do to save the environment, being in a world that's been changed by human activity is rendered aesthetically stupefying in its horrors. One use of petroleum that's unleashed uh, formidable carbon dioxide into the planet's system is production of electricity. And clearly Judy is and or aligns with um, and or transports through electricity. Just think of the oil electricity current at work in Lynch's lyrics to the song A Real Indication from Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. The lines, and there's wires in the air and the asphalt man is all around me. Electrical wires and petroleum roadways are infrastructures of the Anthropocene, infrastructures of Judy and Twin Peaks. In the latest season, the electrical lines verit veritably crackle and bristle in the final episode as they stretch across the desert expanse between immense metal pylons with designs that are unmistakable invocations of the Owl Judy symbol. Once we cross into the Anthropocene, it could all be different. These infrastructures of energy and transit seem to scream. But it's good to temper that negativity with the images of Agent Cooper returning from the Black Lodge to Earth through the electric walls uh, outlets and the cigarette lighter battery charger socket in Mr. C's car, nearly whisked him back to the Black Lodge. Let's take to heart some of the last words Margaret Lanterman, also known as the Log Lady, voiced to Deputy Hawk in Part 10. She said, Electricity is humming. You hear it in the mountains and rivers. You see it dance among the seas and stars and glowing around the moon. But in these days, the glow is dying. What will be in the darkness that remains? Watch and listen to the dream of time and space. It all comes out now, flowing like a river, that which is and is not. The Log Lady is highly attuned to the dynamic energies and entities driving the narrative at its most cosmic scale. And here she's talking, waxing poetic on the beauties of electricity, at least as it exists outside of turbines, transformers, and wires. By holding simultaneously in our heads both Margaret's vision of, good, of the good potential in electricity and its evil potential to disseminate Judy and precipitate the Anthropocene, those who watch Twin Peaks are charged with triangulating energies, geologies, and people in a particular cinematic climate that's good for thinking in nuanced and alternative ways. After all, we do live inside a dream in that we keep burning oil and electricity like there's no tomorrow, even as we increasingly feel the ecological horrors just over the horizon as they haunt us more each successive day. We are in a timeline. We need to bend that timeline. Twin Peaks can help. For a closing thought, Let's turn to the start of the return, when the giant slash fireman instructs Agent Cooper to listen to the sounds. Listen to the sounds.
The sounds evoke the, the idea of a mechanical cricket, a familiar non-human animal rendered uncanny through the medium of a signal inscribed on a round platter of pressed petroleum. The vinyl itself records the geological archive of the earth, including the human history of resource extraction and carbon dioxide emission. So when the fireman remarks, it is in our house now, he could just as well be talking about the Anthropocene, a new ecological reality, about which, as he says, it all can't be said aloud. Planetary and geological scales seem to outstrip our abilities to conceptualize, much less to say them articulately out loud. But Twin Peaks, with its radically surreal twists and turns, provides a sophisticated invitation to, and map and model for, going on living and loving in these unsettling and uncertain times. What APOC is this? 